And we're continuing with the very long first chapter of Dragons in the Waters by Madeline Lengel, which is called The Forklift. This time, his concentration was deep. The sounds of the MS Orion no longer reached him. He was reliving a heavy, humid August evening at Pharaoh, the small cottage on an acre and a half, which was all that was left of the once great plantation. Simon and Aunt Leonis sat on the tiny porch to their house. Shack would have been a more realistic word, though it had once been a solid cottage, fanning themselves in slow rhythmic movements with palm leaf fans, rocking in quiet and companionable silence. Boz, the ancient pointer, snored contentedly at their feet. It was not dark yet, and Simon could see an expression of grief move across the old woman's face. As though his awareness had been a blow, she put her hand up to her cheek. Not soon, she said quietly. There'll be a breeze later. Aunt Leonis could not get a job. You're too young. But ma'am, I could work as a field hand or something. No, Simon, education is a tradition in our family, and I'm going to see to it that you have yours. With you for a teacher, don't you think I'm educated enough? No one is educated enough, Aunt Leonis said. I'm still learning. When I stop learning, you will bury me. That will be never then. I'm an old woman, Simon, and ready to meet my maker. I look forward to it with great anticipation. But I would prefer to be certain that you have mastered Latin, which you are not being taught at school. And next week, I intend to start you on Spanish, a language I have forgotten and which both of us surely should know, Simon scowled. I'm not apt to go to Spain. You have an ancestor who helped liberate the South American continent. And I'm not likely to go to South America. I realize that you are insolent, child, but things will change, and meanwhile I will not permit you to be lazy. No, ma'am, but you've already taught me French. Next week we will start Spanish. I still have my old books. Buenas noches, senorita, Simon said. Como esta? That is hardly adequate, and you are speaking with a French accent, and you are being ugly. Is something wrong? No, ma'am. They lapsed into silence, and darkness fell with the abruptness of the subtropics. Around them, a light wind emerged from nowhere and stirred the Spanish moss and the live oaks. Aunt Leonis's fan moved more and more slowly until it stopped and rested lightly on the faded black of her dress. Simon, I will have to sell the Bolivar portrait. But ma'am, you can't. It's your most treasured thing. He was shocked and incredulous. It is only a thing, my son, and we must not be bound by material things. But Aunt Leonis, you think that I would let you go undernourished in order to hold on to some old paint in an old already decaying piece of wood? Oh, Aunt Leonis, ma'am, let me get a job, please. Simon, you are not yet thirteen, and I made a promise to your parents. They wouldn't have wanted you to sell the portrait. When one nears a century, one surely should have learned not to depend on that which will rust and or decay. You are the only person left in my life who has not crossed to the other side of time. I have survived much death, the loss of my only brother, of Pharaoh, of all the other things I used to believe made up the women who, made up the woman who is Leona's fair. But we are not our possessions. That is one thing I have discovered. I am not sorry that I will be leaving you with no material goods, but I must leave you with enough education so that you will be able to choose the manner in which you will earn your living, and you are not getting that from the local school, particularly if you continue in your wish to be a doctor. You must be able to pass examinations and earn scholarships. I have to supplement your education. You are a good student, Simon. Yes, ma'am, but you're easy to learn from. You make it all fun. Miss Leonis picked up her fan. I will put a notice about the portrait in the Charleston Papers and in the New York Times. I'm not rushing into this and unadvisedly. We have enough money to get us frugally through one more year, and by then we should have found an appropriate buyer. The summer dark was so thick that Simon could no longer see the old lady, but he reached over and took her hand in his. Her hand felt as thin and warm and dry as an old leaf. He knew full well that if she said they would start learning Spanish next week, start they would. 
he understood with a corner of his mind that Aunt Leonis was an extraordinary old lady, but she had always been part of her of his environment. Now she was home, the rock on which he stood, and he could not look without flinching on another change in life, which would be even more radical than the change that followed his parents' death. Without Aunt Leonis, where would he go? Who would he be? As though following his thoughts, she said, Quentin Falls Journals, his letters to Ninian and his mother in England are in my jewel box. You might be able to sell them one day. When you are 21, they will be yours to read, even in the unlikely event that I am still alive, and who knows what you will learn. They are all that you will find in the box, but they will stand you in good stead. I have honored Quentin Fair's written request not to read the letters or journals for six generations, which I consider a wise precaution. Even the most innocent of journals, if they are honest, contain pages which could hurt other people. It will be interesting for you to learn whether you are like him in spiritual as well as physical characteristics. Simon demurred, I'd rather read them with you. No, my memory stretches back a long way. There may be things in journals or letters which I'd rather not know. Each month, Aunt Leonis put the notice about the portrait in the papers. We will not sell it to just anybody. It must be somebody who will appreciate and honor it. On a cold evening in January, Cousin Forsyth Far arrived. Cousin Forsyth, Forsyth Fair arrived. Simon and Aunt Leonis were indoors, keeping warm by a light wood fire. The resin-saturated wood burned so brightly that Simon was studying by it. He had finished his regular schoolwork and was doing the Spanish lesson Aunt Leonis had prepared for him. Together, they could speak slowly, but with moderate fluency, although she still deplored his French accent. A knock on the door took them both by surprise. Aunt Leonis reached for her cane, and Boz growled deep in his throat. Simon went to the door. They had learned to do without electricity, so he saw the man in the door only in the glow of the fire. Aunt Leonis rose rheumatically to her feet and turned on a lamp by the round table, which served them as, a, as desk and dining table. Good evening, the man said. Is Miss Leonis fa Farian? Yes, sir. Who is it, please? The man moved past Simon into the circle of lamplight. He was tall and thin and dark and elegant, despite stooping shoulders. His dark hair was graying at the temples and about the ears, and he held a dark hat in his gloved hands. Miss Leonis Fair? She stood facing him, holding her cane as though it were a weapon. Who are you, sir? I am your cousin Forsyth Fair. I saw your notice about the Bolivar portrait in the New York Times, and I have come to inquire about it. Hey, Simon, it was Polly's voice. Simon stood up out of protection of the lee of the ship. Out of the protection of the lee of the ship. Here! Polly and Charles were halfway across the foredeck and came hurrying toward him. Charles said, We've been calling and calling. I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Polly asked, What are you, deaf or something? I guess I was concentrating. Charles clambered over a bale and jumped to, to where Simon was standing on the Orion's prow. What a, great what a great place, Simon. How did you find it? I came looking for a private place. Cousin Forsyth was in the cabin, and I thought people would be coming into the salon. Polly put her hands on her slender hips and looked around. You found it all right. We better check with the captain for protocol's sake, but this is it, Simon. This is absolutely it. I was wondering where we could go to escape the grown-ups. You're marvelous. Simon felt himself flush with pleasure. It's a little cold here, unless you crouch down. It won't be cold in a couple of days. Hey, did you see that hearse with a bullet hole in the windshield? Simon spoke shortly. Yes. Who would want to be driven in a hearse with a bullet hole in the windshield? Who would want to be driven in a hearse, period, Charles countered. Simon did not laugh. Instead, he gave a small involuntary shudder. Someone walk over to your grave, Polly asked. Simon did not answer. He looked out at the foam breaking whitely about the prow. Charles stuck an elbow in po into Polly's ribs. And she said quickly, It's cold out here tonight, all right? Let's go in, Simon. I'm starved. How about you? I'm pretty hungry, I guess. 
Charles and I looked in the galley and spoke to the cook. Dinner is going to be good. He's a super cook. I don't speak much Dutch, but enough to find out what we're eating. Come on. Polly thinks she speaks every language in the world, Charles said. I like languages. Just stop bragging about them. Pride goeth before you know what. Simon followed the amicably arguing brother and sister. As they approached the doorway, they met the captain, dressed in a dark serge winter uniform, who greeted the children with paternal friendliness. Polly pointed to the prow. Captain Van Leyden, is it all right if we go up there and sit sometimes? We'll be very careful and we won't be in anybody's hair. And of course, we'll stay out of the way when we're in port, Simon added shyly. And we can pretend we're setting out to help Bolivar free South America. It is all right, Captain Van Leyden replied in his precise guttural English. As long as you disturb nothing, do not climb into cars or try to open the crates. Oh, we won't. We promise we'll be very careful. The captain smiled down at them. We do not often have children aboard. Why is that? Charles asked. To be free to take a freighter trip means leisure. And for most people, this leisure does not come until after the time of retirement. We usually have no one under 65. Our father isn't anywhere near 65, Charles said. He isn't even 50. No, we have a very young ship this time. There is not much for young people to do, I hope. You will amuse yourselves. Of course we will, Polly assured him. Everything's marvelous, Captain. It's cold now, the Captain said, and you and Master Simon will chill this afternoon. You had best go in where it is warmer. We're just on our way. Thank you, Captain. They stepped over the high sill and made their way along the passage and up the steps. Dr. O'Keefe, Dr. Eisenstein, Dr. Wordsworth, Mr. Theo, and the Smiths were in the salon with Geraldo passing drinks and nuts. Simon did not see Cousin Forsyth. Let's go out on the aft deck, Polly suggested, at least for a few minutes. They walked down the port passage, past the professor's cabin, past Simon and Cousin Forsyth. At cabin five, Simon paused. This is where the Bolivar portrait is. Is it really famous, Simon? Simon pushed the fisherman's cap back on his head. I never thought about it being famous before Cousin Forsyth came along. We have a portrait of our grandmother when she was young and beautiful, but it isn't famous. It's... She stopped as a voice sounded loudly from cabin five. I will not tolerate carelessness or curiosity. It was Cousin Forsyth's voice, followed by a low, indistinguishable murmur. Then, but you were trying to look at the portrait. Don't deny that. The murmur came again, and then Cousin Forsyth's voice was lowered, as it had been when he was talking to Dr. Wordsworth. Is there any reason people shouldn't look at the portrait? Polly asked. Simon shook his head. Not that I know of, but it's all crated, so you can't see it. He certainly sounded mad at someone. Who do you suppose? I don't know. And wouldn't anyone have to pry open the crate to see the portrait? Simon shook his head again. Beyond me. It's made me curious at any rate, Polly said, but she moved on and rested her hand lightly on the handle of the fourth door. For those like me who don't like shower who don't like showers, there's a bathtub in here. Geraldo says he'll unlock it for me tomorrow. Simon asked, Why is it kept locked? Oh, things are always kept locked in ports, and he's been so busy this afternoon. What with us falling in the drink and all, he hasn't had time to do anything else. She started to open the door to the back deck, which was reserved for the passengers. There were lights strung up under the canvas awning, and it looked cheerful, if cold. But just at that moment, Dr. O'Keefe called from the head of the corridor. Dinner's ready, kids. Come along. The passengers sat at two tables. Cousin Forsyth, Cousin Forsyth Simon, Mr. Theo, and the Smiths at one. The O'Keefe's, Dr. Wordsworth, and Dr. Eisenstein at the other. At a third table sat Captain Van Leyden, his first officer, Lyle Bloom, and second officer, Biren Rumiche, the chief engine and chief engineer, Olaf Koster. The essential second language for these Dutchmen was Spanish, and their English tired easily, so it was simpler for the officers to sit apart from the passengers. The captain's table was waited on by John Tenzik, by John Tenzwick, the chief steward. Geraldo tended the passengers. Polly was right; the food was pl- was plenteous and well prepared. 
I believe, Cousin Forsyth said in his lightly ponderous way, very unlike the way in which Simon had heard him speaking to Dr. Wordsworth, that the chief reason Freda's care of passengers is to afford a good chef for the offices. This is as good a registerful as I've ever tasted. Whatever it was, thought Simon, it was delicious and very unlike the nearly meatless diet he was accustomed to. He ate with appetite. He would have been happier at the table with Polly and Charles, where conversation was lively with little bursts of laughter. Polly looked over and winked at him, and he winked back. What was that, Simon? Cousin Forsyth asked. Simon rubbed his eye. Nothing, sir. He looked down at his empty plate, then across the table where the officers were eating. Mine here... Lyle Spoon, the first officer, folded his napkin and said something in Dutch to the captain and left. Simon's table had finished dessert, a delectable mixture of apples and flaky pastry, well before the second table, and everyone had moved out to the dining room, had moved out of the dining room into the salon for coffee. Simon sat at the far end on a long sofa under the four windows. Mr. Theo settled himself in a chair not far off with his volume of Shakespeare. Cousin Forsyth was talking to the Smiths and pointing to a card table in the corner of the room near the door to the foyer. Simon closed his eyes, suddenly overwhelmed with sleep. Simon, it was a whisper. He jumped. Polly and Charles stood in front of him. Oh, hi, I was just sleepy for a minute. Geraldo came up with a small tray of half-filled demitasses and a pitcher of hot milk, put it down on the table, and then bustled back to the other passengers. Polly sat down beside Simon. I'll pour. Have some, Simon? He nodded. I've never had coffee before. Aunt Leonis and I drink tea. You may not like it, then. Put lots of sugar and milk in, and then it tastes sort of like hot coffee ice cream. Simon followed her instructions, tasted and smiled. Oh, Simon, Polly said, her long legs and green tights stretching out under her plaid skirt. I'm so glad you're you. Suppose you'd been some awful creep. Whatever would we have done all cooped together like this? Simon nodded in solemn agreement. I'm glad y'all are you too. Now that he was relaxed, his voice was warm and rhythmic. Polly flashed her brightest smile. I like the way you talk, Simon. It isn't all nasal and whiny like some of the Southerners we've met. I was born in Charleston. It was the simplest statement of fact. Polly giggled. Snob. Simon blushed slightly. I like the way you talk too. It isn't British. Of course not. We're American. It's just clean and clear. Aunt Leonis loves music more than anything in the world, so voices are very important to her. Her voice is beautiful, not a bit cracked and aged. Somebody compared her voice to Ethel Barrymore's. I guess she was some kind of famous actress in the olden days. Polly poured Simon some more coffee and hot milk. Hey, look at the grown-ups over there, nosing each other out. And we knew about each other right away. Well, they didn't almost get drowned together, Simon said. You saved my life, so that means... It means we belong together forevermore, Polly said solemnly. Charles was looking across the salon at the adults. They've forgotten how to play make-believe. That's a sure way to tell about somebody, the way they play or don't play make-believe. Polly, you won't ever grow too old for it, will you? I hope not, but she sounded dubious. Simon pushed back a lock of fair hair from his face. My Aunt Leonis is very good at it. Actually, she's my great-grand-aunt or something. When people get ancient, they seem to remember how to play again, although I don't think Aunt Leonis ever forgot. She says you can tell about people, whether they're friend or foe, by your sense of smell, and that, and that most people lose it. fee fi ho fum Charles intoned. I smell the blood of an Englishman. It's probably our pheromones, Polly said. Ah, uh, what? Simon asked. Pheromones. They're really quite simple molecules, eight or ten carbon atoms in a chain. And what they do is send out, well, sort of a smell, but it's nothing we smell on our conscious le- on a conscious level. We just react to it. For instance, a female moth sends out pheromones at mating time, and a male moth comes flying, but he doesn't know why. He just responds to the pheromones, and we're not any more conscious of them than moths. At least most of us aren't. Charles is sometimes, she stopped and said, it's obvious that we're children of scientists. Maybe Aunt Leonis's sense of smell is simpler and just as good. She sniffed delicately and looked with quick affection at Simon. You smell superb, Simon. 
He sniffed in his turn. You smell right lovely yourself. Maybe it's your red hair. But Polly sighed. I haven't worn a hat in years because I keep hoping that if I keep my hair uncovered and let the salt air and wind and sun work on it, maybe it'll bleach out and turn, I'll turn, and turn into a blonde. It hasn't shown any signs of happening yet, but I keep on hoping. You look right nice exactly the way you are, Simon said firmly. He might be a year younger than she was, but Polly felt a warm glow. Look, your cousin Forsyth is playing bridge with the Smiths and Dr. Eisenstein. That's a funny combination. Simon looked at the card table. Bridge was another unexpected facet in cousin Forsyth, who was shuffling with great expertise. At any rate, Polly said, we're certain about Mr. Theo. Certain? Simon asked. That he's all right. He's a friend of Uncle Father's, and that means he's okay. Uncle Father? Simon asked. My godfather, Canon Tom Tallis, you remember. We were talking about him at tea. Why do you call him Uncle Father? Polly gave her infectious giggle. <laughs> Rosie, our babysitter, started it when she was just be Rosie, our baby sister, started it when she was just beginning to talk, and we all took it up. We see more of Uncle Father than we do of our own grandparents because we live so many thousands of miles apart. But Uncle Father was in and out of Portugal for a while. So he's sort of a, a extra grand. So he's sort of an extra grandparent for us, and I guess I trust him more than I trust anybody in the world. Charles said. But he warns you about that, Paul. He says that no human being is a hundred percent trustworthy, and that he is no exception. Polly shrugged. I know, but I trust him anyhow. Trust isn't a matter of reason; it's a matter of pheromones. I trust Simon. Simon beamed with pleasure. Ma Leonis says that it isn't proper to ask personal questions, but you all can ask me anything you like, Polly asked immediately. How does it happen that you have a portrait of Simone Bolivar in your family, and why are you taking it to Venezuela with Cousin Forsyth? Simon's eyes took on the pale gray stare which meant that he was moving back into memory. Aunt Leonis lived as much in the past as in the present, and the games of make-believe she played with Simon were usually forays into time remembered. Simon, his voice low and rhythmic, said, My favorite ancestor is Quentin Fair. He was the youngest son of a large family in Kent in England in the olden days. The eldest son got the title, and there was the army or the navy or the law or the church, and after that the youngest sons had to fend for themselves. So when Quentin Fair was nineteen and announced that he was going to South America to help free the continent, his family didn't even try to stop him. He fought with Bolivar and became his good friend, and the portrait is one painted at the time of the freeing of Ecuador, when Bolivar was at the height of his greatness. Aunt Leonis said that in going to Venezuela the way he did, Quentin really gave up his youth for others. But how did you get the portrait? Not me, and it won't ever not me, and it won't ever be mine now. It came to Aunt Leonis when her brother died because he didn't have children. Yes, but Quentin was English, wasn't he? Polly asked. How did the portrait get to South Carolina? Well, when Quentin finally went home to England, his mother had just inherited a sizable hunk of property in the south of the United States. So he offered to come over and see about it for her, expecting to stay only a few weeks. But he took over his mother's property and stayed forever. Charles, or, but he took over his mother's property and stayed forever, Charles said, as though he were ending a fairy tale. Simon smiled. He met a young girl, Ninian, or Ninian St. Clair, and they fell in love and were married. What a pretty name, Polly said, Ninian. She was beautiful, of course. We have a miniature of her. It's very faded, but yes, she was beautiful. And when Aunt Leonis was young, she looked just like her. Quentin built Pharaoh for Ninian, and all their children were born there. The landscape must have reminded him of Venezuela, especially in the spring and summer, with all the same kinds of flowers. Bologna ve mm. Bougainvillea, Oleander, Cape Jessamine, and the great lush jungle trees. It wasn't tamed and cultivated the way it is now. Pharaoh, Polly mused. It's sort of a pun, isn't it? I like it, Simon was slightly defensive. Well, so do I. And the portrait? It's been handed down from generation to generation. It's a very special treasure, since Aunt Leonis never married. 
It was to come to my mother as next of kin and then to me. Only we had to sell it. But why on earth would you sell it? Polly asked. We needed the money. Oh, Polly flushed slowly, as she had that afternoon when speaking Spanish to Geraldo over Simon's head. It was the last of the portraits Aunt Leonidas, Aunt Leonis sold. Most of them, Aunt Leona sold most of them when she, ha when she had to sell Pharaoh, the big house, and most of the furnishings, and the silver, and the grounds. Her father tried very hard to keep Pharaoh going, but he got into terrible debt, and when he died, Aunt Leonis had to sell everything, even the portrait of Quentin Fair. But at least it stayed in the house, over the mantelpiece in the library where it's always hung. I look like him, my aunt says to Quentin. I hope when I grow up I'll be like him. And you had to sell and if you had to, if you had to sell Pharaoh, where do you live? Polly asked. Aunt Leonis kept an acre and a bit and we live on an old in an old cottage. If there's a heavy rain from the northeast, the roof leaks in exactly eight places, which is a powerful lot for a small house. Aunt Leonis has various buckets and pots and pans which she puts out to catch the leaks, and she's managed to work it out so that the rain hits each pot and plays a different note of, a scale, of the scale, and we have a mighty fine time listening to the different tunes the rain makes. Your Aunt Leonis, Charles said, sounds like the kind of aunt everybody would like to have. Who else would have thought of making something magic about eight leaks in a roof? I sometimes think Aunt Leonis doesn't enjoy it nearly as much as I do but she never lets on that she'd re really rather have the roof repaired. We have a pretty little garden patch behind the house, and we have live oaks and water oaks all around to give us privacy, not that we need it. The Yankees who bought Pharaoh are only there a couple of months a year. Sometimes Aunt Leonis and I pretend we're visiting our cottage, bringing turkey broth and custard to a sick child, and that we really live in Pharaoh the way Aunt Leonis did when she was young. We have a right fine old time together, Charles said slowly. I think I love your Aunt Leonis. She's a great believer in all things working together for good. It's Cousin Forsyth who's come to the rescue now, and maybe that's good, but I didn't want her to sell the portrait. Charles spoke quietly. I guess she sold it because she loves you more than she loves the portrait. Simon nodded and looked across the salon to where Cousin Forsyth was spreading out his cards with a flourish. Polly's regard followed him. How does your Cousin Forsyth come into it? Out of the blue, you might say, Simon replied and told them. So you really don't know him very well. Simon looked across the salon and thought of the conversation he had heard between Dr. Forsyth and Dr. Wordsworth. I don't think I know him at all. And that is the end of chapter one.